So, I am Amarjit Singh from engineering team of flipkart.com. So, basically today's talk will be about uh, how we deliver a solution for ebooks so that they can be rendered on web browser. So, it will be more of a implementation kind of talk where other talks were like uh, UX and product sense of a particular application. So, this talk will be quietly focused on the implementation part of that. So, as the name suggests, it is a book plus browser, but actually we will be giving the examples specifically to the this implementation, but we will be talking the problems in general. Like uh, if you are developing a common web application, what are the things that you should take care of, what are the implementation options that you have and which one you should prefer over the others and why. So, starting, so starting about that, so thinking about, I mean, what is it about? So, basically it is about like, uh, say if you are having an ebook, so there are multiple ebook readers available in the market like uh, on iOS, Android, Windows you will see like iBooks, Kindle, these all are the readers available for the Android, iOS and Windows thing. So, if you are delivering a solution to the browser for the same thing, what are the problems there? Like, uh, it is absolutely fine for the uh, native application like they have uh, usage of a lot of memory they can use, they can use directly use the processor thing, they do not have any foundation provided by the browser itself, so they have a much freedom there. They can uh, use the cache provided by the, I mean so they can use the storage directly. So basically what they can do, they can download the book to their local storage and they can use it. It is very simple for them, like uh, they can directly I mean uh, go from first page to hundredth page because complete book is there. So if you think about the same scenario in other web application. So, there might be the same things like uh, you are having a say any store kind of application where you are selling something and they are say 1000 products in your in your catalog, fine. So, in if you are developing a basic native app, so there might be a scenario all those products, some of those products are already in cache or already on the local storage of the that particular platform. So, in that case, I mean developing the app on that particular device and developing the app on web is completely different. You do not have such privileges. So, I will be mapping one to one these examples that I have faced during the development of the web reader at Flipkart and uh, to the generic things, fine. So, it will be mostly regarding the architecture of a web design. So, you will be having a various modules in the web application like security layer, UI layer and client DB layer and uh, data transportation thing. So, how should we, we target what is our problem, how much data we are transferring and uh, how much client side work we have to do, what are the possible solutions to that and which one we should opt for, okay. So, just as I said, so I mean initial part of the talk will be like uh, addressing the problems first, okay. So, basically I will be telling the what are the problems that we have faced in the say developing a ebook reader, what are other problems that everybody will be facing in the developing a web application and uh, and then I will be taking you to the example of a real implementation of that part, how we achieve something and uh, then I will be giving you some technology related aspects like uh, yes, this is the kind of technology that can that can serve this kind of purpose. So, that starts with the ebooks first. So, I will just brief you about the, so that you have the context of the talk, I will brief you about the, what are the possible ebook rendering solutions that can be used on the web or any application. So, ebooks basically are used as a EPUB plus PDF formats. So, one is a format called EPUB, other is a PDF thing. So, EPUB is something like, uh, it is a basically a zip file. So, it is having all the HTML, all the images, CSS and all the resources stuff. Fine. So, it is just like a web page that is local to your thing, local to your machine, just you click on say some index.html page and it is referencing all the resources from there. So, EPUB is mostly like that. Where PDF, you all know that PDF is a set of commands that whatever document format that tells the render that I want to draw say a rectangle here, I want to print this text here and there. So, this is something about PDF. So, when we were developing, so if you are developing a reader, so you never know about the customer use case. Some would say, I have iPad, why would I need a web application? I will go to the iPad and I will read every book there. 
but especially in India, you'll see uh, the customer base for the laptop and desktops is a lot. Plus, academic books are, I mean, they mean a lot. So they can be a real source of your getting from startup to a real established product. Okay, so you'll see a number of students are reading the books on the laptop and desktop things. So you need a web solution for that. But there is a specific problems to the this thing. So as I told you, it's a zip file. And you never know what could be the size of a book. It can be from say 500 KBs to hundreds of MB. Fine. So all the native apps like iOS or Android or Windows app, they will be downloading the complete book at once. They can do that. So basically what they are telling the user, just download this book once and read it after that. Fine. So this will be no pain for the user. Yeah, fine. I can download it once. But if you are making a web solution, you are telling every user every time that download the book again and again. This is not a solution. And same problem you can have in other apps as well. Like, uh, so say you are dealing with a store kind of thing only, and uh, there are say, thousand products in your catalog. You are never gonna say, yes, I will be downloading thousand products at once. You will be using some approach like uh, some pagination caching kind of stuff, some uh, chunking of the responses from the server so that it can be rendered fast. But the problem was a little severe in this case. The reason is, so this is a basic structure of an EPUB, as I already discussed. So the reason, what is the problem in chunking of a EPUB or a PDF? Is this, it is using a number of resources. Fine. So a book might be like, uh, it's a zip file, but say first chapter is using a resource from say, that is also used for, from the say 10th of the chapter. It is a possible scenario. So what will happen in that case? So basically you have to take care all the resources should be served with the chunk itself. It should not be like some user is reading on the first chapter, is not able to see the font, is here for reading a Hindi book, just because the font is not there, he's reading it some other language, which is actually uh, some trash thing. So managing the resources is one of the problem. Other thing is something that is very cool with the native app is uh, annotation thing. So annotation thing is like uh, whenever you are reading a particular book, so most of the user would like, yes, I want to bookmark this thing. Or I would like to highlight this thing. I would like to make a note out of it. So these kind of things. So again, if you are chunking something, if you are breaking a book, breaking a zip file into some chunks, then you are always having this problem. Where should I go? Where should, how should I sync this thing with other things? So you need some kind of sync platform in between as well. Fine. So then there is a, a high chance that what should be the corresponding solution, like I'm a user, some user would say, I don't care if it's a web app or a software, you gave me this platform, I want to just download it once and read it after that. It might, there might be a scenario, say, you are in the meta refresh, there is a, I mean, you are don't, you're not having a very good network, you would say, yes, from home, I'll download the book, I'll come here and read it meanwhile. So there is a possible solution they are asking for is offline solution. So basically, and if you, if you are developing web apps, you would know that today we are having some option to make a offline thing like we are having HTML5 application cache. We are having uh, this web SQL thing index DB and uh, SQLite. But all these are in very new stage and so you will be taking care of a lot of stuff like some browser support SQLite, other sports index DB. So all that stuff. So we, we will be looking into that as well. So again I told you, is this problem with this app only? No, actually this is the problem with most of the apps we'll be facing these days. So the presentation that I'm showing you is built on a web application as well. So that is slide is, it is slid.es. So if you talk about this application only, so say I'm changing something and meanwhile I'm off the network. What will I do now? I'm not expecting to be staying on internet forever. If I am refreshing the page, it will go away. So there should be some backup scenario in, in meanwhile. Like say, if I'm changing something, it will be in my store, in my say, local browser's database, and that it will be syncing to the server. If that kind of, that kind of solution is there, your customer will be really delighted. So it's all about delighting the customer at end. So you can, I mean, map n number of problems with the n number of web applications with the same problems. So, how we should approach these web applications and uh, 
So if you talk about the generic web apps, these are the basic problems that you any web application will be facing. Like so, if it's a web application, say it's a, a thing like a stock exchange. So stock exchange, there will be a huge data that will be transferring, say, 10 times a second even. So price fluctuation will be there. So data has to be transferred and it has to be synced at ma at max level. I mean, there should not be any delay. So if that is the case, so you, there will be a huge data to be transferred. Okay. So and you cannot expect every customer to be on say 16 Mbps or 32 Mbps connection. It can be on say edge. How you will be dealing that? So browser can't process this much of code. So if you see, you never know which browser or which machine client is on. So you might be expecting everybody on a Mac machine or with a 8 GB of RAM, but he's not actually. So how you decide how much data should I compute on the client and what rest should I compute on the server? So drawing a line in between is very important here. Then there's a the content security. So if you are making a web app that deals with the say payment transactions or some say with the credit card or the debit card of the user, you need to provide the credentials from the client to server or the simple thing. If you are dealing with the book only, the no publisher will gonna tell you yes, you can transfer the uh, content itself directly. You have to use some kind of encryption, decryption kind of stuff. So for that, I know that if you are asking about a security from the web app, it is uh, actually a lot. You cannot hide anything from a web app. So, but still, there should be some level of security. And what is that level where you are satisfied? That level has to be maintained very well. Like, and uh, what are the options that we are having in JavaScript? to use these things like you are using some say AES encryption on the server using say, Java, PHP or any other language. There are a lot of libraries available there. But if you are talking about a JS solution, they are very few available. So I'll talk about a library called CryptoJS. So CryptoJS is a library provided by the Google and uh, it deals with the, a lot of security related stuff like uh, they have the implementation of AES, SHA and uh, key and all that stuff. So it is a very well stable library and uh, as I told you, I myself have tried, I mean, encryption, encryption, and vice versa using Java and then to the CryptoJS and PHP and all that stuff. It really works very well. So it can be handy if you are talking about this kind of security solution on a web app. So it can really help you there. And it's absolutely fine if you are saying a user that, fine, man, you are running my web application on a browser. What else you are expecting out of me? I'm delivering the content in 10 seconds. But actually, this is not the solution that you are providing to the user. You should take care of every step. So caching, how you will cache a content. Caching is not only the content that you are storing on the storage itself. So it, it is absolutely fine if you, the call to a particular service and response time remains the same, but it does not look same to the user. What is that? So say I am reading on a particular page in a book. Fine. As I told you, I'm say sending a chunk responses. I'm reading say first chapter. Okay. As a user, it will take, if he actually reading, it will take say 10 minutes to, for the user to download that. I mean, to read that. Fine. So if I say as soon as the user will go to the last phase of the chapter, then I will download the book. Say next chapter. Then it is like user will wait for say next one minute or two minutes for the downloading stuff. But meanwhile, what you can do when user is spending 10 minutes of his time, when he's reading the first chapter, meanwhile you can cache the next response. So some kind of tricks like that, that, that is actually not a, I mean, technology th thing. It's a, just a smart, smart code load that you have making like a user should not wait. They are always a number of solution. It cannot, it may be that it is not feasible by the technology, but can be feasible with a smart move. As I told you, the difference between mobile apps and uh, these web apps are like they have a privilege or privilege of going to the storing the content, storing to the directly use directly use of the all the resources that a web all the resources that a mobile have. So it does not have any foundation like browser gives to us. So oops, oopsie. So again, internet goes away. Sorry for that. So basically, say this is a basic thing that I was targeting about, uh, it's a EPUB reader for web. So it's a web reader provided by the Flipkart.com. So basically what happens just now is, 
I just tried refreshing that page. So there are a lot of books in my library, but as the internet is not working, so I'm on the offline thing. Okay, so this is a very much problem that a user can face. Fine. So this book might be like uh, it might be as long as say five MB, but but actually means to the user is it's just a book. And if I bought a book from you, it should render in within say two or three seconds. Fine. So if it is on a say online thing as well, I'm here. Fine. So if I am uh, noticing that if a user is actually reading, he will spend some time on this page. What will I do? I'll catch the next page, and so on. So, but what happens if a user goes from here to say here? You can never expect, I mean, you can never cache every possible scenario like user can go from second chapter to the 10th chapter, from the 10th chapter to the 15th chapter. But if your response is chunked in this case, you are not sending the complete thing at once, then you are again saving a lot of time on the client side. So this is another use case of this chunking chunking of the HTTP response or whatever kind of response you are using. Other thing is uh, this client side database thing, as I told you. So what you can do is like, uh, so say I'm downloading this book, fine. So when I'm downloading this book, as it's a web application, you have to take care of all the cross browser things and what are the, what are the web, web storage things that are provided by one browser to the other browser. Obviously, it's a new thing to the browser, so you have to take care, yes, I'm supporting these browsers and I'm not supporting these browsers, but it's always good that you are providing something to a particular section of the clients if they are ready to move to the new versions of the browser. Rather than telling everybody, yes, we do not provide a, do not provide an offline solution because uh, every browser is not supporting it. So what I think is like we should go for at least majority of the people rather than going for none. So, so like say you are searching something. So this is another trick that we have used here. So basically, what you can do is like uh, these days browsers are uh, actually very fast indeed. So they provide you a lot of computation skills as well. But again, that is specific to the machine to machine. So you have to consider everything. But you can uh, do some kind of uh, tracking as well. Tracking is absolutely fine with the product sense as well. But tracking can be done for the knowing the machine that your code is run running on. Based upon that, on runtime, you can take the decision. Yes, my server is on heavy load, but my client is having, say, very good processor there on, so it can actually, the, if I move my code from server to client to render, because it's JavaScript, it can also compute the, some of the things. If I can move my code from the server to client, it's absolutely fine, because I know my client is well enough of doing the computation in time. So, now I'll, so basically, as I told you, like, these are the problems and these are the solutions that we have, how we have provided there, so I'll be, Talking about the technologies now, I mean like uh, available libraries and all that stuff. So one is that I came across is this Phantom JS. So this Phantom JS is a basically a headless browser. So what it does is it, it has this V8 and WebKit thing for rendering the HTML and computing the JavaScript thing. So basically what you can do is like you can give a say actual HTML thing which say, you say, run this JavaScript on this HTML, HTML thing, it will give you the exact output as, as a browser does. So what you can do with it? So in this case, say, if I am, a, I need to make the content fluent, so I would need that it should be rendered on the browser so that I, I can see, yes, this thing is renderable, and I need to take care of this in current chunk, and how much height and width it's taking, all that, all that stuff. But if I do all these things on the client, what will happen? It will take a, a lot of time. It can easily hang the browser. But this thing you can easily do offline. Offline as in, not on the runtime. What do you do? You can use this library to render all the things in offline ways. Offline as in, when the user is not accessing it, process it, save the things, and then use it. So now your problem space from say 100% is narrowed down to 5%. And your client has to deal with only 5% of that. What is the other use case of this Phantom JS? So these days, 
all the web apps will be using the Ajax stuff. Fine. So basically, most of the stuff will be transferred after the page load. So what happens these kind of scenarios? If you are talking about the search engine optimization, this will not help you. Like a Google crawls your thing, and there is nothing in there, so that you can index or most of the user is there uh, searching for something, they will not find that there because the content was not there when the Google was crawling it. Fine. The reason is it will not run your JavaScript for sure. So how to tackle that scenarios? So what you can do, you can check for the so it sends you different HTTP agents. This all the crawler things. You can check for the agent and then you can say, okay, fine. So what I'll do, I'll pass the complete code to this page using Phantom JS. What it it will do? It will run all the JavaScript for you. It will give you the actual HTML out of it. Now you give this HTML as a response to the crawler. Fine. So now now crawler knows that actually that these are the things it can index. So this is a very good, I mean, helper in these kind of scenarios when you are talking about the SEO thing. Other is the content security, as I already told you, using the crypto JS. It's a well, its performance is actually very good. So as uh, you target the server side things plus this JavaScript solution, actually it is very comparable to all these things. Next is uh, using server for high load work. So I'll, I'll give you example of that. So say there is a thing that so as a developing web application and uh, if you target every specific area, say if I am checking for the uh, core stuff of the website, it says yeah, my my servers are really not on that much load. They can process on behalf of the client. In that that case as well, you can use this Phantom JS thing to process to pre-process the page that you are going to give to the user, and then give the pre-process thing to the user, and then it will I mean that will be partially processed for sure. Then it can process the next thing, and your page rendering time will be much faster as compared to the other one. Then there is a identif how you identify the task and categorize them. So it's like uh, if you are, I mean, before develop starting the developing of a particular web application, knowing the yes, these kind of scenarios can happen. This piece of code or this piece of work would need a lot of computation. Can I do it offline? How will I do it offline? What are the things that I would require there? Can I partially process it? All this, those stuff. You should take care of these things first before I mean starting developing, starting developing everything on say client first. Then you see, oh, it is not helping there. Then you move to the server. So there can be an intermediate solution as well. There is another very good solution provided by. So if you have uh, used the templates like handlebars, so handlebar is a templating language basically. So basically, what it does, it has their own syntax just like any language. So it says, yes, this is a if condition. If this if condition matters, if model have this thing, then render this HTML and put the values inside. If else, do this thing. Fine. So I'll give you a very good example with that. So say, uh, all of you would be using REST clients these days. So REST APIs, the APIs are like they can give you the complete HTML as well. They can give you the JSON as well. So say, I have a API that can give you that can give me the exact renderable HTML or the model that can, I can feed to the this template to get the complete HTML. So there are two scenarios there. Fine. So say now I know my client is heavily loaded. It, it can process that. It cannot process that. But my servers are very free at the current scenario. So what I can do is I will make the call to the server that other API which is giving me the exact HTML out of it. Fine. And uh, I see if client is lightly loaded and has server is high, heavily loaded, I'll ask for the JSON, the same template will be available on the client side, and I'll put the model to the client side, and I'll get generate the actual HTML out of it. So handlebar do this very well. So what they have is, they have a, uh, so saying is you have some hello.html file, which is having the handlebar, handlebar template thing. So you can pre-process that template, it will generate you a JavaScript out of it, which is just a function call. You just pass your context and your model to it, and it will give you the complete HTML out of it. So basically, what you can do, you can directly move these JavaScript files from the server to the client and uh, let the client do the processing for you. So, other is like there is too much data to be transferred. 
so first of all we should always think about do i need every data is every data useful for the client at once can the client wait for the i mean say 2 second so consider a thing like you are having a scroll stuff on your page where say you are showing a so, so say it's a browse page fine a browse page will be having say 100 of products fine but for a client you know only the 10 of the products will be visible at first go okay so you make a decision i'll give only the 10 products as soon as he'll reach the end of the first first page then i'll ask for the next page and i'll render that so try thinking about the other solution before going for yes this is the final thing i have to send to this client there is no other way so we have to make these decision offline as well then there is a new thing to the html5 this is web sockets so everybody is actually excited about that web socket what are these web sockets so web socket is basically a two way com communication between the client and server as the other sockets are so basically otherwise you have to continuously pull to the server yes do you have anything to send just like a stock exchange thing as i told you so it needs say 10 calls per second to the server checking about anything changed anything changed anything changed so server cannot tell the client directly yes something has changed now do the processing you have to do call backs only a little to the web socket so now web socket is giving you a two way communication thing so if you open a socket between client and server server can send you the data and then client can make yes i got the some kind of message i need to process this data and all that's all but before directly diving into the solution like uh, i want to use web socket that's it just because i want to learn it this is not the correct way to produce i mean go to approach to a problem so consider this scenario i check the performance with this thing so say i am delivering the online reader online reader as in client has not downloaded the book he is just directly coming to my site and then clicking on the cover page he wants to read it online only fine now if i give the web socket thing there what will happen i'll open a web socket that is using the server resource for sure because i am opening a socket between client and server a user is there to read two pages he is a very slow reader and he reads two pages in 10 minutes after 10 minutes he go away he goes away what happens my resource is consumed for 10 minutes without any use just because i said yeah i want to use web sockets so we have to figure out how frequent i am sending the data does this require actual two way communication there might be a case it is not requiring two way communication but still the results can be good but what is the rate of data transfer what is the idle time that you are letting web sockets to be open you make a web socket for one hour that means you so you just reserve the resource from the server for one hour out of one hour say 50 minutes the socket is idle what is the use of that so, so we have to make these decision this these decision are specific to the problem so say if you are downloading a book so uh, internet is not working otherwise i would have shown you that so if you go to this webdriver.flipkart.com there will be books with the download icon there you just click on the download icon it will show you the progress thing so all the chunks and everything will be getting downloaded on the client it will be saving to the client machine so in that scenario so this scenario is completely different to the online scenario why the online scenario was like in 10 minutes on average i am sending a particular chunk that is of 10 kb say but in this scenario it will be like in 2 minutes i have to transfer 10 mbs of data what is that so in that scenario if i checked so it was like on a average connection so sorry so when you are sending the web socket when you are making a web socket between client and server the say server is sending some packet to the client so you have to first of the first of all you have to make a particular number average number that is always making a web socket busy fine so say i push five messages in 2 minutes to consume the complete bandwidth of the socket i need to come come up with a particular number fine so that i do not let socket to be idle for most of the time but again that depends on the bandwidth of the client so you have to try with a say go with the three packets at once go with the five packet at once and try to come up with a particular average number that yeah this is fine if i go with this number i will be not wasting the web socket there fine so i tried uh, say five five packets at once with web socket so basically i am sending five different data at once from server to client and saving that to the client machine say like that so if i am doing that 
it was like I achieved four times performance as compared to the simple HTTP request I was making. That was really good and good stuff. So, basic point is, basic point here is like you have to make a call if you are using a particular thing while you are using it. It should not be like only the learning purpose, it should also serve the product purpose. Then there is this client code management and speed. So if you are a front-end developer and uh, then you will obviously notice that thing. You started developing something, it was having say 10% of the feature. So most of most of the time you will have it from the product guys like uh, we are making this product but at the initial stage we just want the 10% of it. So you write the code as per the 10% of it. Then you see okay now we are going to the 20%. Now you write the code from 10% to 20% and go this, this thing goes on. So in the end when you see your code itself you will see oh it looks like I haven't wrote this code. Actually you should you would have not wrote that code basically but it was a step by step process so you just forgot about taking the taking care of the next steps when you were on the first step. Okay so the, so you will end up saying yes why I am re rewriting again I wrote this function earlier on I wrote this class earlier on I can reuse that one it, it just lacks say two or three features that are required in the new thing. So basically what I am saying here is we should picture the complete thing once. Picture the complete thing once say what are the use cases according to that architect your UI thing as well. It is not like JavaScript so, I, so basically if you are if you have learned this JavaScript for the two days you can write JavaScript it's that simple. Write a function declare a web use it it's that simple. So most of the times it will be like but if you are developing a web there is a quite difference between website and web application. So web application code can grow like exponentially. So you have to take care you have to think first then start coding it. Then this JavaScript MVC. So basically MVC is something like a model view control thing. So that helps you a lot basically managing the code that was the first thing. Second I gave you example of this handle bar say. This is very well managed using the MVC. Just have the MVC thing on the client as well on the server. Let the things talk to each other. Let them decide which way they should go like should I use, use server thing or should I use the client thing. So there are a number of frameworks available for the JavaScript MVC as well. Then there is a new thing this is web workers. So web workers is like uh, earlier on the browser was just giving you one thread to process, process everything. The reason was quite straightforward. It was just like uh, you are dumping some HTML page on the browser. But nowadays it is not, not like that. You are doing a lot of competition stuff as well on the client. So if you are doing competition stuff there might be a case you do not need DOM. DOM DOM thing I mean you are not inter interaction interacting with the HTML elements but you are doing some computation stuff. If you are doing some computation stuff then you can use it, then you can do it in some other thread as well. This is web worker but what, what, uh, what is web worker. So but important thing to take care before using web this web worker is like you should divide the task say I am uh, making a feature there is a view of this feature. And this view is actually interacting with the DOM, with the HTML elements. This is the computation part. So I get this response from the server. I need to process this response. Then I need to feed this response to the view. So that part, feeding the response to the view, is only possible in the DOM. So you have to be on main thread. But on the other hand, if you are converting that partially computed thing from the server, you can do that computation in the other thread as well because you are not dealing with the DOM. You can go away from the main thread. So at that time you can go to the web workers. So the best approach is like you should divide the things first then start doing, using these things. Before, or it's uh, really bad if you are in middle of something if you have wrote 50 percent of the code then all of a sudden you realize oh I can do this thing in web workers. I, you just directly jump to the web, web, web workers. Actually, you wasted half of the DOM things in the 50% earlier on. So things should be like think first, then do it. So next is managing client DB layer and persistence. As I told you earlier, on this client DB is very new. There are two basic options available. One is index DB, other is a web SQL thing. So index DB is something like uh, you can directly save the JSON objects or JavaScript objects into the database. 
you can create the index on that say you are having a collection of a particular say student kind student objects you can say i can query on the student dot name i can query on the student dot roll number kind of stuff you can create index directly other approach is web sql thing web sql is simple sqlite what it does is like simply sql things you just it's a relational schema so you can directly save everything as a relational thing then you have to take it out convert it into javascript then use it so basically now w3c have uh, made this index db as a part of its specification so this web this sqlite will be i mean uh, gone away in some time so what is actually the basic reason behind is if you are dealing with a client db you are dealing with the javascript only there is no other language available so there is a extra overlay if you are using the sqlite or sql kind of structures why you will be converting your javascript to the sqlite first then you will be saving the sqlite when you are reading it you are you will be converting from sqlite to the its corresponding relational schema then you will be converting that to the json object or javascript object so there is a extra level of work that is that was required there so this webkit thing webkit browser they started implementing this sqlite first now every everybody is moving to the index db this uh, internet explorer 11 also has this uh, index db only so but the only problem there is like uh, they do not support uh multi indexes so say if i am on a student thing i want to make a primary key association with this say name and roll number it's not realistic example but say i want to make a primary key association with the roll number and name you cannot do this thing in i11 they still have to implement it so just to give you a, you should take care of these things so this is the final structure, final architecture we came after thinking about all these things and that really helped for us so i'll just brief you about uh, all the things that i spoke and everything uh, how they were related in actual implementation so there was a epub thing epub the as i told you it's a zip thing then there is a chunker thing which is saving this thing to say some storage what is this chunker chunker as i told you this phantom js thing can actually perform a very good offline processing for the javascript thing so there is a lot of task that has to be taken care by the client only by the browser only but that is actually too much for the client you can do that with using phantom js okay so something like that then it is going to the storage then they are this client side will be having offline cache and client db everything it will be having there security part then there are some of our internal terms like flip stream flip sync and cds there are other platform application like android app ios windows 8 app so basically this flip stream is a internal service what it is doing is like so say you are using web reader on the browser you make a annotation you make a highlight there you go to our ios app you go to our android app the same thing will be available here you left it on a say first chapter second page you will find yourself on the same page on your ios or android app so this thing is really dealing very well with every other apps there is a flip stream flip stream is just a uh, content delivery uh, sorry it's uh, just a uh, delivering of chunks and uh, all responses for the book all resources for the book then there is a cds this uh, content delivery system for us so it's uh, dealing with the static resources and all that stuff so that's it for my side any questions uh, are really welcome yeah please so you are saying about the uh, web socket right sure so have you tried the web rtc data channel left in that is also for transferring now it's, it's saying uh, like it's your more. voice is breaking can you please hold it still uh, web rtc data channel uh, have you tried that like it, it's, it's saying like you more faster than web socket so have you tried that compare that or something is it fast okay. so there are number of things that can be in draft at a particular stage so these uh, mozilla mozilla organization this chrome organization they are continuously developing a new things in the market they but they are all experimenting it so this is a web socket is something that html5 actually considered in, into its draft working draft that is actually converted to a it's on the final stage only so it should be like you should be using something that is for sure going to the final stage so that's why just to make it 
that way we have used web sockets uh, yeah so and uh, one more thing i want to understand like phantom js use, use it right so it's acting as a like a kind of mediator right so rendering and all it's making so uh, pre rendering it's doing like that hmm. right? so phantom js is like uh, obviously what will you do with uh, rendering a particular html page on server it is not visible to the client for sure so what is the use of that the use is like i gave you one example of the crawler where you run have to run the javascript to to uh, generate a html page for indexing only for the crawler there can be the same example in my case there is a every possible thing in ebob is html only i cannot go to the details what i have used what i why i have used but the actual use case is just when you have to render html plus javascript on the server so it will take care of all the css resources it will refer everything it will actually draw it but it's a headless browser it will not it is not visible to any anybody but it can actually process it Yeah, I have a question regarding the chunk size and the screen size. Is uh, one chunk size is equal to the content on on one screen, or uh, multiple chunks are required for one screen rendering? Okay. So there is a call to that. So basically, as he is absolutely right there, like the screen size can vary. How will you decide the chunk size? So you have to come up with a number. Yes, at max this can be a screen size of the user. Say fine. about that i partially process something then i send that partially process thing to the client now say i targeted a particular screen resolution which is the maximum one say now the current screen resolution is say 1/10th of that so now i'll process the partially thing to the final thing so actually the chunk can be of one screen size or 10 screen size it varies so basically it's just about making a call So that's what I said. Use of Phantom JS. Partially process the data if you can on the server or offline thing, so that your client do not have to do a lot of stuff. And the content is actually very, very fast visible to the user. Okay. And regarding devices, uh, does the as it has been tested on TVs also, smart TVs. TV. Yeah. So basically, we tested on this uh, Samsung TV. They have this inbuilt browser, which is. Uh, which is rendering very very smoothly the same thing on itself so it's really good for the user if you are giving the user such experience like so user can go anywhere i mean it's very good for the user if he sees okay fine i am in front of this big screen size now i want to read something on that he has bought a 1.5 lakh tv to do something else but he wants to read it you can you should not do say oh we made it for a 1000 1024 by 768 pixels only so it's just about delighting the customer For our case, it actually renders very smoothly. That's it. Thank you, everyone.